What does it mean when you tell someone their work is shit? It wasn't so much that he was a tyrant. Uh, it was things that you never see on YouTube. The bad parts of Steve, of, of at times being an a It usually means their work is shit. I did try to talk to him once at a party and he was super rude to me. Why, why does he have, he doesn't have to be that way. What created Steve Jobs' dark side and how did it impact Apple? Steve is a very singular case where the company really was on a path to die and it goes and becomes the most valuable company in the world with some products that are really quite amazing. This is the first $3 trillion company trading in the U.S., probably trading in the world. Once he got in control, he had ways of making sure every little detail of a product was right. Um, the guy had a certain magic about it. We're ready to go, gentlemen. We are ready for a shot again. He would be casting spells, and I would see people mesmerized. Look at that. Look, I'm on television. Hey. There aren't going to be many stories like that. When I set out to make this documentary, I was solely focused on understanding how the dark side of Steve's personality was formed. But along the way, I also learned what made him so successful, and why he kept on going at 100% right until the end, even as he was battling cancer. So by the end of this video, you will have the answer to all these questions. But first, let's start where it all began because the way he was brought into this world was very different and plays a big role in his life. My biological mother was a young, unwed graduate student, and she decided to put me up for adoption. She felt very strongly that I should be adopted by college graduates, so everything was all set for me to be adopted at birth by a lawyer and his wife. Except that when I popped out, they decided at the last minute that they really wanted a girl. So my parents, who were on a waiting list, got a call in the middle of the night asking, we've got an unexpected baby boy. Do you want him? They said, of course. My biological mother found out later that my mother had never graduated from college and that my father had never graduated from high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would go to college. This was the start in my life. During the first six months of Steve's life, his non-biological parents did not know if they could legally keep him. So they were faced with the emotional difficult task of caring for a child, not knowing if it would become their own. But years later, when Steve turned six years old, they moved to a house in Silicon Valley. The valley was then becoming what is famous for today, a mecca filled with technology engineers and innovation. But one day, not far after they had settled in, Steve's life was about to get more complicated after meeting a neighbor kid across the street. He opened up about the situation in a taped interview with the author of his biography, Walter Isaacson. Remember right here on the lawn, telling Lisa McMorrow, who lived across the street, that I was adopted. And she said, so, does that mean your real parents didn't want you? Ooh, lightning bolts in my yeah. I remember running into the house, I think I was probably crying, yeah. asking my parents, and, and they sent me down. They said, no, you don't understand. They said, we specifically picked you out. They said, from then on, I realized that I was not just abandoned. I was chosen. I was special. And I think that's the key to understanding Steve Jobs. Identifying as being rejected and special are two very conflicting characteristics to carry as a self-image. And if we take a closer look into personality development, we can see how this all ties together in a bigger picture. Personality includes those stable psychological characteristics that define each human being as unique. Most experts agree that whatever the cause, an individual's personality is solidly established by the end of early childhood. Was the directed side of Steve's self-image the root cause behind his dark side? And if so, what role then would this other, brighter, special side come to play in his life? Twelve, I think I saw my first computer. Ten, maybe, ten or eleven, maybe eleven or twelve. It was down at NASA Ames. And uh, it was, it, I didn't see the computer, I saw a terminal and there was theoretically a computer on the other end of the wire. And I fell in love with it. And I saw my first desktop computer at Hewlett Packard, which was one of their, it was called the 9100A. It was the first, first desktop computer in the world. Ran BASIC and APL, I think. And I fell in love with them. 
perhaps growing up and merged within the logical realm of technology, Steve could escape any thoughts of being rejected. And since computers wouldn't abandon him, his love and passion could safely be expressed without the risk of getting hurt. When I was 12, I called up um, Bill Hewlett, who lived in Hewlett-Packard at the time. And again, this dates me, but there was no such thing as an unlisted telephone number then. So I could just look in the book and look his name up. He answered the phone and I said, hi, my name's Steve Jobs. You don't know me, but I'm 12 years old and I'm, I'm building a, a frequency counter and I'd like some spare parts. Code calling a CEO of a massive corporation is not something most kids would do, but identifying as someone special gave Steve an unusual level of confidence, which he quickly learned to use to his advantage. He talked to me for about 20 minutes. I I'll never forget it as long as I live. And he, he gave me the parts, but he also gave me a job working at Hewlett Packard that summer. And I was, I was 12 years old. And, and that really made a remarkable influence on me. During the summer working at HP, Steve made a few friends. And later at 16 years old, one of his friends told Steve about this other guy that he had to meet and said, he's also named Steve, loves technology and to do pranks just like you. He was the first person I'd met that knew more about electronics than I did. And so I, I was, uh, I liked him a lot. And he was uh, maybe five years older than I. We met on the sidewalk as I remember, and we just start asking each other, what did you do? What pranks did you do? And I would tell which ones I did, and then he, what would you do? You know, what have you done with electronics? And he built this, and I've designed all these computers, and, and we just hit it off. We became fast friends and started doing projects together. Jobs had found somebody that he could share his passion with, but it quickly became clear who was the best engineer. I was such a genius in computer design that it just overshadowed any, you know, anything he would do in the technical realm. And I was sort of like the top young designer you could ever run into in the times. And Steve was the, ne he was a leader. He was always trying to be one of those special few people in the world, the few that take the steps forward and, you know, like, you know, a Newton, he'd spoke of Newton and, and um, Shakespeare and things like that. And I know that he really wanted to be one of those people, but he wanted to find formulas to have, have find a company and sell things. So every time I designed something really cute, Steve would come by and say, I know how we can sell it. His, he was very fast thinking. He had an idea, he wanted to go here, he wanted to go there, he wanted to go there. He was almost driven with a lot of um, anxiety and, and hyper motion. Steve's drive was clearly motivated by realizing his self image as someone special. He needed proof that it was true because without it, the self image that remained was only that of someone that got abandoned. Job's persistence and drive later got him a job working as an engineer at the game company Atari. But he quickly became known for having very little patience with people. He would in an arrogant way let his colleagues know about their faults and incompetence. Perhaps this was a way to set himself apart from others and feel special. But after just a few months he got restless and decided that he needed to go on a spiritual journey to India and find a guru that could make him enlightened. Steve commented on the decision later in life and said, For me it was a serious search. I've been turned on to the idea of enlightenment and trying to figure out who I was and how I fit into things. Once he arrived he already knew about the famous guru that he had planned to seek out, but when he came to his village he quickly found out that he had just passed away a few months earlier. So then he made a decision to explore India by train in hope to find the answer to his questions. But after a few months of searching, he came to the conclusion it was best to go back home and said, I figured out I was not going to meet anybody that was going to make me enlightened. His best friend at the time revealed another, slightly darker side to Steve's journey when he said, Job's quest seemed driven partly by not knowing his birth parents. There was a hole in him and he was trying to fill it. When he came back home, he thought about hiring a private investigator to find his real parents but he decided not to do so for the time being and said, I didn't want to hurt my parents, referring to Paul and Clara Jobs. Another close friend of the college, Greg Colholm, opened up further in the book and said, Steve talked to me a lot about being abandoned and the pain it caused. He was deeply angry about the fact that he had been given up. He had even tried primal scream therapy in an attempt to cleanse himself and get deeper into his frustration about his birth. John Lennon, who Steve was a big fan of, had undergone the same primal scream therapy a few years earlier. He later released the song Mother, which dealt with his feelings about the father who had abandoned him and his mother who had died in a car accident as he was a teenager. And Steve was often playing this song.
In Steve's continuous search for answers, he turned to a Zen Buddhist community back home in Los Altos. Part of this community was also a girl that he liked. Chrisanne and Steve had both shown interest in each other back in high school. In the documentary Man in the Machine, Chrisanne explains how Steve one day approached her at the schoolyard to give her a poem. It was rewritten based on Bob Dylan's lyrics. But the moment he noticed the group of people surrounding them, she got for the first time see a glimpse of the not-so-romantic side of Steve. He just scanned the quad and the darkness that went over his face, the, the edge, the worry, the dissonance was shocking to me. And I was young enough where I thought, did I say something wrong? But later I realized that wasn't what it was. That was part of who he was. I mean, that was one of the things that, that I was attracted to is that he had a lot going on inside him. In recent years, Chrisanne revealed a very private conversation she had with Steve's biological mother upon meeting each other for the third time. She revealed it during a talk at Google about her new book, The Bite in the Apple. I was standing alone in the living room waiting for Steve. She came in and in an urgent way began telling me that they had adopted Steve, but that the birth mother had taken them to court because she didn't want her son raised by the jobs. Clara told me that they had to fight to keep him and then confessed that she had been terrified to love Steve for the first six months of his life for fear that they were going to take him away from her. At that she just stared at me and I saw her face a deep matter-of-fact guilt. And then she told me that even after they had won the case when he was two years old, he was so difficult a child to parent that she wanted to give him back to the agency. And I think she may have been trying to indicate a root cause to his cold side. I was concerned about her and wondered, in a simple 17-year-old way, if they did come to love and cherish him. But that day I was totally clueless and would be for some time because Steve was very good to me. The lack of love in his infant years combined with identifying as someone that got abandoned probably left a constant void inside Steve. The trip to India and the primal screen therapy was probably also motivated by having this void filled. So far he had not found anything that would fill it, but that would soon come to change. The Apple One was a formula, one board full of chips. It was a small board, actually. Then Steve Jobs didn't know that I had built it and designed it. I created it to show off to a computer club who spoke of the social good. When we had our own computers, we would educate and we would communicate and we, the geek would, would be important. And I gave away my design for free to everyone at the club. I passed it out on paper to everyone at the club. I was a hero at the club, showing my computer every two weeks. <laughs> Steve Jobs came along and saw it, and he saw the interest in it. And he said, wow, let's um, sell these PC boards, build them for $20, sell it for $40. Woz was the brilliant hardware engineer and focused on the core design of the computer. I was worrying about which parts we ought to use and how we were going to build these things and how a, sort of a, somebody that wasn't a Woz was going to manage to buy all the extra parts you still needed to buy and plug this thing together. A good leader has to spot the talented resources, the, the best people to do the different jobs and the right products, the right direction to go. So he was the direction setter and he just knew that I was the best at what I did. Once again did Steve's passion for technology also become a convenient distraction away from his emotional troubles. But this time around it introduced him to the business world in a serious way. Jobs took lead on making sure they capitalized on Wozniak's creation. The first Apple logo featured Sir Isaac Newton sitting on an apple tree where he supposedly discovered gravity by an apple falling on his head. Steve Jobs didn't know it at the time, but he would ironically have a similar moment as Newton himself after the release of the second product. The Apple II led Steve to an amazing discovery which became his driving principle for the remaining course of his life. Then we had the Apple II, which we knew was 10 times the computer. I built this thing the way computer people build computers. You can increase the memory. If you don't have enough, you can add more. If you, if you need, think of a device like a floppy disk, you can add a card connected to a floppy disk. When that program, the spreadsheet came out, VisiPel, this is the only one of those computers, the three of them that existed, that had enough memory. The Apple II could hold up to 48 kilobytes of memory, which today doesn't seem like much, but at that time was maybe three times as much as it's 
competitors. And that's why VisiCalc was written for the Apple II. Calculate all your income and expenses month by month by month, make a change and see the, the bottom line months later. All of a sudden, the sales, sales shot up 10 times. We were the first company to come out with a reliable, inexpensive floppy disk drive. So they had to write it for this computer only. It was the only computer that could hold it. And so if VisiCalc had been written for some other computer, you'd be interviewing somebody else right now. And it was because of that design decision and, and other design decisions like it that the Apple II really beat its competition. It was an accident too. We hadn't really thought this is how this is. We're gonna we're gonna make sure that we don't you know, have to you know that we're well ahead of the competition because of this. We just lucked out. The Visical incident proved how the computer could generate scalable possibilities and impact millions of people. From this point, Steve knew that he had stumbled upon the beginning of a new technology revolution, and he was at the forefront of it all, holding the baton. Finally, would he get recognized as someone important in the world? But it was one problem. Almost nobody believed in a computer back then. So before his first ever TV appearance, Steve had to come up with a vision that would help people see the future that he foresaw. You're getting this thing right yeah. yeah. uh -huh. yeah. God, look at that. Look, I'm on television. Hey. Hey. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. TV in New York, too. Yeah. What's that? TV in New York, too. No, no. Uh, yes, you are. Am I really? Are you serious? They're watching you yeah. right now. They got you in New York. God. No, okay, this thing I'm going to let you put in your own ear and just... Really? You see what it is? It's a talk back. They're going to talk yeah. to you. Now, this is not the real thing, though, right? You just want a picture of me now? That's, yeah. They're going to just sit here. Okay. Great. Great. That'd be good. You need to tell me where the restroom is, too, because I'm deathly ill, actually, and ready to throw up at any moment. So. Good. Try to cross the hall. Great. I'm not joking. Uh. We're ready to go, gentlemen. New York's ready for a shot now. Yeah. Actually, I read a survey in Scientific American in the early 70s, and what this survey had done was it measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species of things on the planet, birds, fish, dogs, and it ranked them. And it turns out the condor won. Condor was the most efficient, and man came in with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list, somewhat disappointing. That didn't look so good, but then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle. And a man on a bicycle, or a human on a bicycle, blew the condor away, completely off the top of the charts. And what it showed was that man as a tool maker has the ability to make a tool to amplify an inherent ability that he has. And that's exactly what we're doing here. It's exactly what we're doing here. So for me, a computer has always been a bicycle of the mind. Uh, something that, that takes us far beyond our inherent abilities. You could say that the Industrial Revolution was basically an amplification of a human ability. Sweat, right? We amplified sweat. Fractional horsepower motors, et cetera, et cetera. What we're working towards now is the ability to amplify another human ability. Devices can free a person from many of the drudgeries of life and allow really humans to do what they do best, which is to work on the conceptual level, to work on the creative level. And uh, I think we're just at the early stages of this tool very early stages and we've come only a very short distance and it's still in its formation but already we've seen enormous changes I think that's nothing compared to what's coming in the next hundred years it's the 1980s and the success of Apple II had led to massive expansion in their Cupertino office Steve was only in his early 20s, but had an important role in a company that was leading the computer industry. He was fully committed to his mission in making Apple part of the revolution he saw coming. He was the, the main marketeer, if you will. You know, his public, his public comments about it were so important, and he was on the covers of so many magazines. Every one of those magazines sold Apple II's. That helped us all. That had always been a big important part of his life, too. Was that authentic to him as a human? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. One can assume that Steve was eager to prove to the world that he was right in his prediction. But it was not all in positive spirit. His relationship with Chrisanne was unstable and the two were going back and forth. She mentioned how Steve's cold side was becoming more present in the early days of Apple. And it seems that Steve was fully aware of this. He told me on a number of occasions 
And in a number of ways, he knew he was going to lose his humanity in the business world when he grew up. How did he know his future? Because I had no sense for mine. By the time I figure out, I got to get out of here. Um, this is not working. Um, I don't want to be in their club. That's when I got pregnant. What happened when you told Steve that you were pregnant? Um, I told Steve in the dining room. Steve's jaw clenched in, in this searing anger, and he runs out the door, kind of like a teenager, slams the door. Steve made it clear that the news was highly unappreciated, and it's hard to say what the root cause behind his frustration was. Perhaps he thought that the baby would distract him from achieving greatness with Apple, or that the newfound success had given him a chance to start fresh and leave everything that reminded him about his troubled past behind. Only Steve knew the truth. But we do know that he denied that the baby named Lisa was his for many years, even after a DNA test proved otherwise. And even though he devoted himself fully to Apple and his vision, the company's future was far from certain. You know, Apple was in a state of paralysis in the early part of 1985. And I wasn't at that time capable, I don't think, of running the company as a whole. Apple's momentum was already starting to slow down in 1983. The board wanted an experienced CEO to help run the company and gave Steve the final say in who they would hire. But Steve rejected all their suggestions, so the board then proposed that they look for someone that came outside Silicon Valley. The name John Scully came up, who currently was the CEO of Pepsi. After meeting, Steve took a liking to John and got determined to get him to leave Pepsi for Apple. Well, the real story is that Steve wanted to be the CEO himself. They didn't think he was ready to be a CEO. And Steve and I spent about five months getting to know one another and we would meet almost every weekend. We're looking out towards the Hudson River and I said, Steve, I thought about it, but I'm not coming to Apple. Steve was impressed with Scully's marketing efforts during the Pepsi-Cola wars. So even when he declined, he got even more determined to win him over. He was dressed in his blue jeans and running shoes and black turtleneck sweater, except in those days he had very black hair. Remember, he was 26 years old. He got about half a meter from me and just stared at me and this long pause. And then he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? <laughs> Or do you want to come with me and change the world? And it's like it knocks the wind out of you. And that was what Steve Jobs was like. He just had that ability to come up with this incredible right thing to say at a moment when he thought he was going to lose something. A week later, I was working at Apple. And the reason he recruited me, because I didn't know about how to build a computer, was that he loved the Pepsi advertising. We did something called Pepsi Generation and then Pepsi Challenge. And we call it experience marketing. And he said, that's what we have to learn how to do because I'm building this machine for creative people called Macintosh, didn't exist at that point. And it's gonna be a creative tool for people who don't know anything about technology. Steve had led Apple in releasing a series of products up to this point, but none of them could match the commercial success of the Apple II but he was still filled with hope that the new Macintosh computer would be the one that revolutionized the industry. And he needed Scully's marketing experience to help make it mainstream. But John Scully got other directions from the board, which made the two get into a conflict. I was brought in at a time where the only cash flow for Apple for the next three years was the Apple II. The sales were going down. The Apple III had failed, Lisa had failed, uh, Apple II was getting pretty old, and the company didn't have any other you know, cash flow coming in. So the focus I was given by the board was turn around the Apple II and keep the cash flowing. When the first Mac came out, we introduced it with a lot of fanfare with a commercial at the Super Bowl and it was it got a lot of people excited, but when they started using the product, it didn't do very much. Um, Moore's Law, 
processors weren't very powerful. And it drove Steve nuts, and he got depressed. People don't know from that movie how deeply the Macintosh failed, how deeply our stock slid down, how we had to regroup quickly and, re and build a Macintosh market over three years while we had huge revenues from the Apple II, and how Steve was trying to kill the Apple II in a lot of ways and do very unfair, unrealistic things to it. That's not known. He got mad at me, and he said, uh, you forced me to price it too high. I want to lower the price. He said, I want to shift the advertising from Apple II over to the, to the Macintosh office. And I said, Steve, if you do that, you're going to throw the company into losses, and we're a public company. We need to go to the board. I wasn't going to sit there with a public corporation as the CEO and see us drive the company into losses without going to the board of directors. So they asked the vice chairman, Mike Markula, to study it for about 10 days to talk to all of the executives. And he came back and reported to the board, not to me or to Steve, but to the board. And he said, uh, I agree with John. I don't agree with Steve. He was asked to step down running the Macintosh division. At the time that he and I were friends, I, I was, I'd say, clearly his closest friend, because we were together seven days a week. We, we you know, talked about everything in, in, in life, and he was much more emotional than you've ever seen him in any of the, of the movies. What can I say? I hired the wrong guy. That was Scully? Yeah. And uh, he destroyed everything I'd spent 10 years working for. Um, starting with me, but that wasn't the saddest part. Uh, I would have gladly left Apple if Apple would have turned out like I'd wanted it to. He basically got on a rocket ship that was about to leave the pad, and the rocket ship left the pad, and um, it kind of went to his head. He got confused and thought that he built the rocket ship. Um, and then he kind of sort of changed the trajectory so that it was inevitably going to crash into the ground. I was still relatively new in Silicon Valley in those days. I came from corporate America. I didn't understand enough how important a visionary founder is. I think in hindsight, uh, when you're doing innovative products the way Apple has always done, uh, at that point, uh, to lose the founder, a particularly a visionary, brilliant, genius founder, was a mistake. So anyway, I, I, uh, I was told in no uncertain terms that there was no job for me. At 30 years old, Steve was pushed out from the very company that he started, which probably made his insecurities around rejection seem relevant again. I volunteered, I said, why don't I start a research division? And, uh, you know, give me a few million bucks a year and I'll go hire some really great people and we'll do the next great thing. And I was told there was no opportunity to do that. Oh, wow. So, uh, and my office was taken away. It was, it was, I mean, I'll get real emotional if we keep talking about this. He never forgave me for that. And Steve lived in a world of black and white. There was, there were no grays. John Scully ruined Apple. Uh, and he ruined it by bringing a set of values to the top of Apple, which were corrupt. And that corrupted some of the top people that were there drove out some of the ones that were not corruptible and brought in more corrupt ones. I was out, and very publicly out. What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone, and it was devastating. I really didn't know what to do for a few months. I felt that I had let the previous generation of entrepreneurs down, that I had dropped the baton as it was being passed to me. I was a very public failure, and I even thought about running away from the valley. But something slowly began to dawn on me. I still loved what I did. The turn of events at Apple had not changed that one bit. I'd been rejected, but I was still in love. A few months later, Steve found a Next, a new company that specialized in computers for higher education. They never achieved any success with their hardware, but managed to stay alive by pivoting into doing software. We're in this really difficult time where no, you know, I, I mean, I sort of think another month's going to go by and there's still not going to be anything running on the sun that's very interesting. And another month will go by and there still won't be anything running. And it just seems like it's just, and I guess maybe that's just the way it has to be. 
At the time at Next, Steve faced the difficult reality of being a beginner again. But he also got the time to step back and reflect, acquire new perspectives and lessons from the mistakes in his past. Most people that are able to make a sustained contribution over time, rather than just a peak, are very internally driven. You have to be. Because in the ebb and tide of people's opinions and of fads, uh, there are going to be times when uh, you are criticized. And criticism is very difficult. And so when you're criticized, you learn to pull back a little and listen to your own drummer. And to some extent, that isolates you from the praise if you eventually get it too. The praise becomes a little less important to you and the criticism becomes a little less important to you in, in the same measure. At 31 years old, Steve turned inwards again, which led to the decision to seek out his birth parents. After some struggle, he eventually got hold of a number. It turned out it belonged to his birth mother, Joanne Simpson. Upon meeting, she repeatedly expressed her apologies and told Steve that she'd been filled with regret. Steve quickly calmed her down and forgave her. Then she told Steve that he had a full sister by the name Mona Simpson, who was a praised novelist. Steve visited Mona in New York quickly thereafter and the two became very close. As they got closer, Mona pushed Steve to repair the relationship with his daughter Lisa, which also seems to have contributed to new perspectives in his professional life. A few more and yeah. Good question. Um, I'm not sure I learned this when I was at Apple, but I learned it based on the data when I was at Apple. Uh, and that is, I now take a longer term view on people. Ten years have now passed since the departure from Apple. Steve had not only found clarity around his abortion, but he had also met and got married to his wife Loreen, and they now had three kids together. But it was not only his views on relationship that expanded in this time. Steve also ventured into the entertainment industry as he bought and turned around the graphics company Pixar, which later released the world's first animated movie, Toy Story. His life had taken a positive turn and he had matured as a businessman. But was this also true in his personal life? Did the new relationship heal him from feeling abandoned, or did the betrayal at Apple leave scar tissue in his heart, reminding him that people couldn't be fully trusted? He worked on Next for a long time, but in that time frame, he learned what it took to be the CEO of a computer company, making new products, getting them tested, getting software, the best people in the world developing them. In 1997, Apple stock had been declining for some time and the company was desperate for a new strategy. Therefore, Apple ended up buying Next for 429 million along with 1.5 million shares of Apple stock. We're gonna be building our next generation operating system on Next technology. Steve's role was only going to be temporarily as an adversary consultant to help save the company. So when he came back to Apple, he was really ready and we were like a platform for him. It's just that um, he was even concerned whether Apple would ever be um, saved. Steve was hedging his bets for a while on how much he would get involved. He knew that going back was a risky commitment. If he would take on the role to help save the company and fail, it would reflect badly on him. But on the contrary, if he would succeed, he would make a comeback into the hardware industry. Because he had, after all, tried and failed doing it at Next. Saving Apple was also a chance to prove that it was a mistake to let him go. Besides, at Apple, he had a much better chance to make a big enough dent in the world to be remembered as someone special. Something we know had been a strong driving force in his past. So the stakes were high. But later that year, he committed to take on the role to help save the company. And he implemented three brilliant initiatives that helped keep the company alive. The first thing he did was to secure a $150 million investment from Microsoft that helped bought the company some time. Microsoft is making an investment in Apple. Microsoft is buying $150 million worth of Apple stock at market price. What this means is, is that Microsoft is going to be part of the game with us. 
as we restore this company back to health, have a vested interest in that stock price going up. Then he made a bold decision to only keep 30% of Apple's ongoing projects and kill the remaining 70% of the current operations. We examined the, the future product roadmap, not the products that are shipping today, the future ones that we were working on. And what we found was that 30% of them were incredibly good. And about 70% of them were either pretty good or things that we didn't really need to be doing, businesses we really didn't need to be in. And so we've paired a lot of that back so we could focus the same amount of original resource even more on what was remaining. Last but not least, Steve knew that their brand had been neglected for some time. He wanted to remind people what Apple stood for and what they believed in. So Steve oversaw the initiative of creating a new fresh marketing campaign called Think Different. This is a very complicated world. It's a very noisy world. We're not going to get a chance to get people to remember much about us. No companies. And so we have to be really clear on what we want them to know about us. Even though Steve had matured as a leader, he was still infamous for being harsh and relentless in his management style, which was a public perception he didn't care too much to defend. I don't feel my job is to win a popularity contest right now. You know, I feel my job is to help the team at Apple do the right things to turn this company around so that it can really prosper again, and, and I think that's going to happen. Steve expected that the people around him wanted to do the best work of their lives, so he never held back in telling people that their work was not good enough. People are being counted on to do specific pieces of the puzzle. And the most important thing I think you can do for somebody who's really good is to point out to them when um, they're not, their work isn't good enough. And I've always taken a very direct approach. Some people have hated it, you know. Steve expected everyone to be as dedicated as him, and he was working around the clock. He told Walter Isaacson that when he returned to Apple back in 1996, he worked from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day since he was also leading Pixar's operations. It was rough, really rough, the worst time in my life. I had a young family, I had Pixar, I would go to work at 7 a.m. and get back 9 at night, and the kids would be in bed. I couldn't speak, I literally couldn't, I was so exhausted. I couldn't speak to Laureen. All I could do was to watch a half an hour of TV and vegetate. It got close to killing me. Looking back, Steve later traced his health problems back to those days. He revealed that one of his motivating reasons was that he wanted to build a lasting company and said, When I got the chance to come back to Apple, I realized I would be useless without the company, and that's why I decided to stay and rebuild it. Perhaps this commitment led to his early death, we can't know for sure, but this commitment was certainly a reason why Apple reached the success it did. Believing in himself, largely, believing that he had ways of thinking that could be made into reality, and a lot of times his limitations of knowledge of what computers were led us to the world that we have to this day. And that was a, it's a type of genius, it's hard to, hard to say, but once he got in control, he had ways of making sure every little detail of a product was right. He showed the Macintosh to Bill Gates, but he didn't show the iPhone to Bill Gates. During the 14 years between 1997 and 2011, Steve Jobs managed to turn the company around from being close to bankruptcy into becoming the wealthiest company in the world, which it remains to this day. Apple led the world into the technology revolution that Steve predicted 30 years earlier. And Steve led the company there by releasing a series of products with groundbreaking innovation, pioneering distribution and outstanding quality. The impression I got was that he wanted very much to be in control of the quality of products so that they wouldn't slip from insanely great down to just plain great. And everybody, almost everybody who watched him from the outside and from the inside close to him agrees with that. You ask why does he do this? And where does he get the energy for it? And there is clearly something in his heart that's propelling him. His pocketbook's not what's propelling him, his heart is propelling him.
I felt it the first time when I visited a school. Uh, and I, it was like had the third and fourth graders a classroom one time. And uh, they had a whole classroom full of Apple IIs. And I spent a few hours there and I saw these third and fourth graders growing up completely different than I grew up because of this machine. And what hit me about it was that here was this machine that a very few people designed, about four in the case of the Apple II. And then they gave it to some people that didn't know how to design it, but they knew how to make it, to manufacture it. And they could make a whole bunch of them. They gave it to some people that didn't know how to design it or manufacture it, but they knew how to distribute it. And they gave it to some people that didn't know how to design it or manufacture it or distribute it, but they knew how to write software for it. And gradually this sort of inverse pyramid grew. And when it finally got into the hands of a lot of people, uh, it blossomed out of this tiny little seed. And it seemed like an incredible uh, amount of leverage. And it all started with just an idea. And here was this idea taken through all of these stages, resulting in a classroom full of kids growing up with some insights and some fundamentally different experiences, which I thought might be very beneficial to their lives because of this germ of an idea a few years ago. And that's an incredible feeling to know that you had something to do with it, A, and B, to know it can be done, to know that you can plant something in the world and it'll grow and, and change the world ever so slightly. Steve saw early on how the computer would become an important tool for the education system along with any form of creative work, which gave him a very noble cause to fight for and a compelling vision that could make him remembered as a very important contributor to the history of technology. That is, as long as the products were really, really good. You know, there's nothing that makes my day more than getting an email from some random person in the universe who just bought an iPad over in the UK and tells me the story about how it's the coolest product they've ever brought home, you know, in their lives. That's what keeps me going. And it's what kept me going five years ago. It's what kept me going 10 years ago when the doors were almost closed. Uh, and it's what will keep me going five years from now, whatever happens. As he got older, some things changed, but his relentless focus on creating great products for people to use was still a clear obsession. Perhaps it was because technology always been there for him, in times when he felt rejected or abandoned. Steve once got the chance to express why he chose to work with computers. The answer is reflecting that his work was a form of self-expression, a way to feel and connect because they are the medium that is best capable of transmitting some feeling that you have, that you want to share with other people. Does that make any sense to you? Oh, yeah. Um, he was thinking about the industry differently than anybody else. Spirit can be put into products and those products can be manufactured and given to people and they can sense that spirit. I mean, if you talk to people that use the Macintosh, they love it. I mean, you don't hear people loving thing, products very often, you know, really. But, but you could feel it in there. There was something really wonderful there. He didn't know what real connection was. So he was a part of the technology that connected the world. Does that make sense? He made up another kind of connection. It always helps. Thank you. This is the medium that I think I can say something in. Mm -hmm. You know? 